Welcome to the Tales of the Realm, a series where we recount the great many tales from the world of Final Fantasy XIV. In this video, we are going to be delving into the complete story of the Binding Coil of Bahamut, the first endgame raid featured all the way back in A Realm Reborn. As a raid, the Binding Coil of Bahamut is an optional part of the Final Fantasy XIV saga, although people might be forgiven for considering it a mandatory experience. This is because it not only deals with the fallout from the original Final Fantasy XIV, as the world suffered a cataclysmic event that justified the original version of the game getting scrapped, but also serves as an introduction to the character of Alice A. Levelier who, in the wake of the Binding Coil of Bahamut, became a part of the game's central cast. In this regard, the tale of Bahamut's ultimate demise is as much a tale of mythic proportions as it is a tale of personal tragedy and growth. I'm Peter from Birds of Play, and in this video I hope you'll join me as we revisit the complete story of the Binding Coil of Bahamut. If you end up liking the video, or just want to support the creation of more Final Fantasy XIV content like this, please consider subscribing to the channel, becoming a part of our growing Final Fantasy family. But without further ado, let us retell a tale of the realm. Our tale begins during the Third Astral Era, as the ancient Alagan civilization reached the pinnacle of their science and Magitech research mustering forth scientific marvels that the Garlemont Empire of the Common Era could only dream of achieving. During this time, the Alagan Empire spread ever outward, laying claim to the surrounding lands, among them being the dragon civilization of Merosidia, located south of the three great continents. As the Alagans sought to conquer the continent, the great dragon Bahamut rose up to defend his homeland from the invasion, but was ultimately slain. In the aftermath, the dragon Tiamat led her brood in the summoning of a primal in Bahamut's image, in a desperate ploy to fend off the Alagan onslaught. But the Alagans captured the primal and locked him up in a great prison they named Dalamut launching it into space, where it could be kept in orbit indefinitely. As eras passed, Dalamud's origins were forgotten, and it became known instead as Manfina's loyal hound, the lesser moon of Hydaelyn. However, as the Galian Empire of the Sixth Astral Era conspired to pluck the moon out of the sky as a part of Project Meteor, the Elder Primal broke free, as the massive structure came plummeting down to the Earth. It was at this time that Archon Louisois Levelleur attempted to summon the Twelve to halt the ensuing calamity, ultimately giving his life to prevent Bahamut's reign of terror. In the aftermath of the Battle of Cartano, the people believed Bahamut to have disappeared without a trace into the ether. However, after the defeat of Gaius van Bielser, which ushered in the Seventh Astral Era, etheric disturbances prompt an investigation into the possibility of the emergence of a primal. To determine the origins of the disturbances, Alice Levelier, one of Sage Louisois' grandchildren, recruits the adventurer who had played a pivotal role in the defeat of Van Balsa, for a mission to explore a fragment of Dalamud, discovered underneath Castrum Occidents, their goal being to ascertain the fate of the Elder Primal and her grandfather, in addition to ensuring that the elegant technology resting within isn't at risk of falling into the hands of the Galian Empire. Inside they find a wall of corrupted crystals, caused by the fragment of the lesser moon, Dalamut, its fall inflicting grievous wounds upon the land. However, 
Before they can venture further in, Alice realizes the internal defenses are still functional. A true testimony to the ingenuity of the ancient Alagans, making it evident why the Galleons would seek to appropriate their technology. As they force their way through the defense system, they come upon one of Bahamut's colossal wings, encased in a formation of corrupted crystals, its span being massive enough to engulf the very heavens. Alice is baffled by this discovery, since as a primal, Bahamut should not be able to retain his corporeal form without his followers. In order to get to the bottom of this mystery, the expedition presses on. But unbeknownst to them, a familiar figure stands watch over them. As they descend further into the buried fragment that separated from Dalamut, they come across one of Bahamut's petrified hands, standing upright in a massive chasm. Once again, Alize is bewildered by the fact that Bahamut still retains his physical form, despite a lack of followers to maintain his summoning. But there are no answers to be found. As they explore the palm of Bahamut's talon, the expedition is assailed by a winged terror, Twintania, an ancient Merosidian dragon brought to heal by the elegance of old and made to do their bidding by use of a peculiar contraption located around the dragon's neck, a receptor made to enslave the creature. The party fells the beast, freeing it from the ancient fetters that had perpetually bound it to a fallen civilization and press on to the innermost sanctum of the facility. Once there, they are greeted by the terrifying sight of Bahamut's severed head, held in place by a set of coils that simultaneously nourish his corporeal form and bind him. The Elder Primal being permitted neither to die nor to truly live. Not knowing enough about what they are seeing, the expedition is forced to withdraw. However, as they make their preparation to leave, Alice spots the image of her grandfather along with another figure in the distance, in the direction of Bahamut's head. She calls out to him, but to no avail, the expedition reluctantly retreating for the time being. As they make their way back to the surface, Alice rejoices that her grandfather is still alive, despite rumors to the contrary, although she is perplexed as to why he didn't join them the expedition having yielded more questions than answers. The party returns to the waking sands to reflect upon what they have seen. Once back at the Scion base of operations in Whisper Bay, they meet with Urianja to discuss their findings. Alize and Urianja surmise that Bahamut's continued presence might explain the land's slowness to heal and the disorder of the etheric currents. If left unchecked, Orianja worries the Primal will drink of Eorzea's life energy until he is whole again and ready once more to rain ruin upon the land. In order to put a stop to this eventuality, they start looking for the other two fragments of Dalamud they saw underground that continue to sustain the Elder Primal in the hope of deactivating the coils that bind him. In the Black Shroud, they discover the entrance to the second fragment. But as they approach the entrance, the illusion caused by the corrupted crystals is dispelled, revealing how the etheric disturbance has warped both the landscape and the local fauna, resulting in monsters the expedition must vanquish in order to gain access to the facilities. Once inside, they encounter the other mysterious figure from before, and Alice recognizes the unique armor as belonging to the madman who brought the meteor project to fruition, the white raven Nile Van Darnus, harbinger of the Seventh Umbral Era. However, upon hearing the name Nile Van Darnus uttered, the armor-clad figure dismisses the name and reintroduces himself 
as Nael Deus Darnus, the latter being a new name bequeathed upon him in commemoration of his service to his deity, Bahamut. Darnus warns the adventurer and Alice that should they venture deeper in the second coil, they will have to answer to him. After doing so, Niall jumps off the ledge of the entrance and disappears into the depths of the dungeon. Refusing to heed his warning, the expedition ventures into the outer coil, fighting their way through powerful foes along the way and making their way to the central decks. There, they are met with a massive maze-like structure filled with ancient Alagan automatons, designed to fend off intruders. At the end of the maze, the expedition is faced with an elegant defense mechanism known as the Avatar, and only once the Avatar is defeated can the party take the elevator down to the next level of the coil. 6,329 yawns beneath the earth, the expedition finally arrives at the final level of the second coil of Bahamut, the Hollow Charts. There, Alizé is shocked to see the spitting image of Dalamut still floating in the sky, deep beneath the ground. They are greeted once again by Niall Deus Darnus, who intends to send them to an early grave for the sin of trespassing upon the sanctuary of his god. Deus Darnus prepares to attack the group, but Alice casts a preemptive spell, knocking the Legatus' helmet off and revealing a white-haired woman bearing the third eye of Galian purebloods. The woman, however, isn't Nylwan Darnus, but rather his sister, Eula Darnus, who had secretly assumed the identity of her late brother following his premature death. Eula, in fact, being the one responsible for Project Meteor. This particular manifestation of her being born of her essence as it was carried away by the currents of ether during the calamity. In a maddened state, Deus Darnus transforms into a dragon hybrid to do battle with the party, ultimately destroying the very battlefield they stand on with a powerful mega flare revealing their surroundings to be not but the result of a hologram. After the party is able to clutch victory by the skin of their teeth, Darnus regains her senses. Staring down their defeated opponent, Alice pities the poor creature, being forced to linger as a husk of its former self, having been denied death. Not knowing the true identity of Nihil von Darnus, Alize goes on to speculate that the appearance of his current incarnation might be a remnant of something plucked from his memory, the real truth ultimately eluding her. After the battle, Deus Darnus appears to have broken free of the Primal's control, which baffles Alize, since once a mind has been ensnared by a Primal, it cannot free itself, which means Bahamut must have relinquished his claim over his subject willingly. Nile Van Darnus curses the Primal for enthralling her, but assures them that her part in ushering in the Calamity was still of her own free will, all the while speaking as if she was in fact the real Nile Van Darnus. Alize asks Van Darnus about her grandfather, and as Van Darnus recognizes her as Louis Soir's grandchild, she feels pity for her, warning Alice to prepare for a cruel twist of fate, and telling her to steel herself for the harsh truth that awaits her. Hoping Alice might not crumble under the pall of her own misery as she herself did as a child. Suddenly, Van Darnus is impaled by a spear of light, and in her final moments, Van Darnus praises the image of the crimson moon before dissipating into the ether. 
Being free to finish what they started, the expedition presses onward into the control room for the coil, shutting down the second coil, thereby slowing down Bahamut's regeneration. However, before they are able to return to the surface, the expedition is attacked by a mysterious man in white, who turns out to be none other than Sage Louisois. Louisois warns the two that they must stop interfering with his master's return. Alice argues with her grandfather, prompting Louisois to attack Alice once more. However, the adventurer interferes. Louisois once again repeats his threat and warns them that should they interfere in Bahamut's resurrection further, he will make sure they die by his hands. Louisois's eyes glow red and reveal that he is in fact tempered by Bahamut, similar to Nile Van Danus. Alice vows to stop Bahamut's return and save her grandfather. Louisois vanishes and the adventurer and Alice return to the surface once again. With the journey within the second coil of Bahamut now complete, Alice resolves to the adventurer that they will stop the return of Bahamut and save her grandfather. Determined to stop Bahamut's regeneration and free Louisois Levelier from his enthrallment to the Dreadworm, Alize Levelier and the Warrior of Light try to enter the remaining interment hulks. As both the vessels in the Burning Wall and the Singing Shards are blocked by crystal formations, however, they must utilize Dalamud's talents as a back door to enter the remaining fragments. This time, they are accompanied by Alphino Levelier. At the central decks, they discover the key mechanism to Bahamut's continued summoning, a countless number of Merosidians bound in stasis to eternally summon the Dreadworm. Realizing the extent of Alagan ingenuity and cruelty, they conclude that disabling the regeneration should allow them to perish. They next discover the regeneration grid, a smaller scale replica of Dalamur itself. Alice realizes Bahamut must have spent millennia gazing at this unchanging view in a prison that scarcely contains him. At the main bridge, they are confronted by Louisois, who attempts to stop them from deactivating the internment hulk's regeneration function. He explains the origins of Bahamut, telling the tale of a fallen great worm of the ancient first brood, whom the dragons of Merosidia summoned as a primal in their hour of need against the Alagan invasion 5,000 years ago, only for the deity to end up bound by their imperial adversaries. He notes that as he summoned the Twelve during the Battle of Cartano, he was exalted. So why should the Merosidians be condemned for evoking their god? Speaking of the sentiments of the Dreadworm, Louisois states that dragons will never know peace as long as man remains. Alize angrily rebukes his words, declaring her grandfather would never shake his faith in mankind and the common people. Undeterred, Louisois notes even his grandchildren's own inability to understand the other's reasoning, despite clinging to the banner of the salvation of Eorzea. Alphino, while not dismissing his words about him and his sister, finds his tirade against mankind dubious. He asks his grandfather if his sudden views are because he is enthralled by Bahamut or because he has transcended the limitation of man's existence. Louisois confirms Alphino's suspicions by revealing his primal form, the Phoenix, whom the party is forced to do battle with. Once the primal of rebirth is defeated, Bahamut relinquishes his hold on Louisois, who regains his former senses. Thanking the Warrior of Light for freeing his mind, he takes time to explain what happened after the Battle of Cartineau. 
the cloud of ether from the failed summoning of the Twelve to contain Bahamut's fury had coalesced within him, and with the prayers of himself and Eorzeans, infused him with the power of a primal. He used his divine power to shatter Bahamut's form, ending the rampage before any more of the realm could be destroyed, and attempting to relinquish Ether back to the land. However, Bahamut's will would not perish, and seized his essence, dragging him underground with the primal's heart. By now, most of the Ether had returned to the land, so Bahamut could not fully restore his form. Instead, the automated fragments of Dalamud sought to rebuild the Dreadworm, having tunneled underground to locate his remains. Luiswa then disables the third interment hulk and creates a portal to the final hold to disable the regeneration. He spends his final moments having a heart-to-heart -heart with his grandchildren, before finally fading away. Now, with their task clear, they proceed to the final interment hulk to deactivate Bahamut's regeneration. Unfortunately, the Dreadworm's wrath will not be so easily contained, and Bahamut attempts to halt the shutdown himself with a Giga Flare. Using their twin grimoires, Alize and Alphino hold back the Primal's power, while the Warrior of Light enters the Burning Heart to confront the Primal's essence. Only upon its defeat can the final internment hulk be turned off, disabling the regeneration of the Dreadworm and allowing the Primal to dissipate completely. With their task done, Alfino and Alice swear to keep what transpired a secret, to fear of Eorzeans attempting to summon their grandfather as a primal. Returning to the surface, they meet with Urianje, who agrees to help them keep the truth of the calamity confidential and allow the matter to rest and the realm move on. Back at the Burning Wall, Alize and the Warrior of Light look over the fragment of Dalamut and parts of the crystallized remains of Bahamut. She leaves a bouquet of flowers in memory of Luiswa, Nael van Darnus, and the dragons of Merasidia, before informing the adventurer that she plans to go on a journey across the realm to find a new path. Thanks for watching. What do you think of the Binding Coil of Bahamut? And what story from Final Fantasy XIV would you like for us to retell? Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already for more Final Fantasy content. And if you're interested in following our adventures in Eorzea, you can even check us out on Twitch. Link in the description below. Until next time, ha <sighs> ha!